Hi, and welcome to Peopling the Past. My name is Chandra Jihu, and I'm an ancient historian and contract instructor at Carlson University in Ottawa. What topic are you talking about today? Today, I'm gonna to be discussing the basics of Athenian democracy. Now, my interest in Athenian democracy is sort of indirect because I study the lessons that an author tells us about it in terms of the moral lessons he wants to teach his Greek and Roman readers. And this is the ancient Greek author, Plutarch. Now, what you see on the left-hand side is a sociogram. This is a visual representation of Plutarch's social network. And on the right-hand side is a map with the location of where all these people are located, both for my PhD thesis. My research asks about the moral message he wants to send to these people, his audience, through how he represents different local places in his works. Of course, one of the places that Plutarch discusses really frequently is Athens. And one of the main moral messages that he wants to send is about democracy, specifically Athenian democracy. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. But first, who was Plutarch? Plutarch was a Greek who lived from about 45 to 125 CE when Greece was under Roman rule. And he wrote two important collections of works, the Moralia, which are philosophic treatises, and the Parallel Lives, where he takes a Greek life and a Roman life and compares them. All of this is aimed at the education of his audience. As you can see, a lot of his writing survives, and this is what makes him so invaluable as a source for looking at the past, including looking at Athenian democracy. What sources or data do you look at? Most of my work focuses on Plutarch's writings, since I'm trying to understand what moral message he was sending to his audience and how he uses the past to comment on his contemporary world. But Plutarch was writing approximately 500 years after the events he describes for Athens' as democracy, which is even longer than the distance that we have between us and Shakespeare. However, in a lot of cases, Plutarch is the only evidence for something that he talks about, so we have to use him. He also had access to a lot of sources that no longer survive today, making him very important. But it also makes sense to look at other sources in order to look at different perspectives. And so I do look at other literary sources. For, the, for Athenian democracy, the most important perhaps is Aristotle's Athenian constitution. But I also look at playwrights and poets. Another invaluable source is epigraphic evidence, which is inscribed written evidence. So examples of this are, are tombstones or decrees that are set up, or even uh, little pieces of broken pottery that have names written on them. And of course, other material evidence like the Clerotarion, which I'll talk about in a minute. What was Athenian democracy? It's important to note that Athens was not the only Greek city that had democracy, but it's definitely the most famous because we know so much about it, and that's why I'm going to focus on it today. The road to democracy in Athens was not a smooth one. There were many reforms, and it was actually overthrown numerous times. But the Athenians always seemed to revert back to some kind of democracy, or at least parts of its system, even under Roman rule, though the manifestations of it are different at each point. The word democracy is a combination of two Greek words, demos, the people, and kratos, power. So simply put, people power. But the Athenians would not in any way recognize the democratic governments of our day built from elections. And this is because the Athenian democracy was for the most part not made up of elected officials, but functioned on a lottery system known as sortition, which I'll discuss in a minute. The direct participation democracy of the ancient Athenians rather than the representative form of democracy of today, resulted in participation in the government that far surpasses that of modern day democracies. Who could participate? To be an active participant in Athenian democracy, you needed three things. You need to be a male, an adult, either 20 or 30 years old, depending on the position, and you had to be a citizen of Athens. But being a citizen wasn't a simple thing. First, you had to be the son of an Athenian father, and later both your parents needed to be citizens. As a citizen, you were also part of one of 10 Athenian tribes. This means that the Athenian democracy does not allow for a huge part of the population to participate, including immigrants, women, freedmen, and slaves. Most scholars think that probably only between 10 and 30% of, of the population could participate depending on the time period. But if you fit the three criteria there, you were a male, an adult, and a citizen, you had the opportunity to participate in the Athenian government. The Athenian government was made up of three main political bodies, the assembly, the council, and the courts. 
The assembly had some basic functions, which include making decisions like whether or not to go to war, electing certain officials, and legislating crimes. In the assembly, there were no political parties, so voting was based on a simple majority. Speakers would make a speech, and the voting was usually by a show of hands, though for some votes, they did use colored stones, a white for yes, a black for no, that were tossed into a jar and later counted. Some of the functions of the council include finance, maintaining the cavalry and ships, advising generals, approving magistrates, and drafting items for the assembly to discuss. And the courts, you guessed it, they tried cases. Like the assembly, the speakers each had a chance to make a speech and they were timed by a water clock. Decisions were made by voting. If there was no set penalty, then each side would propose a penalty that they thought was the right one, and the jurors would vote in a future vote. Cases could last no longer than a day. Most of the officials for all three of these were chosen by lottery in a process called sortition. In a system based on sortition, officials are chosen randomly from a larger pool of candidates. In the ancient Greek world, we actually have material evidence for how this was done. And one of my favorite things from the world because, or from the Greek world, sorry, because it really is ingenious. And this is the Clerotarion, which is a randomization device. The stone slab was incised with rows of slots and an attached tube that no longer survives. Citizen tokens called pinakia were placed in a tribe's chest and then selected randomly to be put into the machine. The attached tube was feed colored stones, either, either white or black, which would fall and decide whether or not these men could serve. The citizen tokens were actually so prized by some Athenians that they actually chose to be buried with them. However, there were still some elected officials. This includes two main categories, those who handled large sums of money, the logic being that if they embezzled, which definitely happened, it could just be taken out of their estate, and the generals because they wanted their expertise. Athenian democracy also had its own system of checks and balances. One of the most interesting of these was ostracism. In Athens, when someone was ostracized, they were expelled for 10 years. So think about where you were 10 years ago and how much has happened between then and now. For ostracism, it was a really simple procedure. It could only happen once a year and only to one person. To vote, you would cast a broken piece of pottery with the name of the person that you wanted gone. These broken pieces of pottery were called ostraca, hence the term ostracism. For an ostracism to pass, you needed 6,000 votes. The person had 10 days to leave and had to leave for 10 years. And the penalty for not obeying was death. But their property and their status were not lost. And sometimes they were called back. Kimon, a fifth century BCE general, whose name is on this ostraca, was one of those who was called back. And this leads me to some of my past research on Plutarch's life of Kimon, which explains the rise and fall and rise again of the Athenian general. He praises the general's efforts. Kimon gives to the poor, he hosts free dinners for his tribe and his estate, and he works really hard to gain popularity. But Plutarch also uses Kimon as a cautionary tale and as criticism for Athenian democracy. Plutarch frequently cites the people, the demos, as fickle and jealous of talented individuals in many of the lives, both Greek and Roman lives. This almost always ends in some kind of punishment for the talented person. For Cimon, it was ostracism. When Cimon is called back because the Athenians need his help, Plutarch uses this as an example of why having so much power for the people was a bad thing. They don't have the expertise to make decisions, and they frequently rather act through emotions rather than through reason, at least according to Plutarch. In fact, Plutarch is not alone in criticizing Athenian democracy. It's kind of ironic that some of the loudest opponents to Athenian democracy come from its system. This includes people like Thucydides, Aristophanes, Plato, and Aristotle. Their main complaint is that the system was too inclusive, which is funny because the modern criticism of Athenian democracy is that it's too exclusive since you had to be a male, an adult, and a citizen, which excludes a large part of the population. What the ancient Greeks argue is that the demos, the people, were volatile and not trained, and that the likelihood of mistakes because of this was actually pretty high. They weren't wrong about this, mistakes were made. For example, in 406 BCE, the Athenians tried a group of generals together instead of individually as the law required. Because they were mad and emotions ruled the day, they decided to execute six of the eight Athenian generals. In another example in 416 BCE, the Athenians voted to execute uh, the entire male population of Milos, an island, and to enslave the women and children because they were mad that they didn't want to become subjects of Athens. 
And then there's one of the most famous examples, the trial of Socrates in 399 BCE, where they voted to uh, execute Socrates, something that they later regretted. In other words, Athenian democracy did fail, and sometimes it failed spectacularly. But for the most part, Athenian democracy seemed to work for the time and place that it existed. How can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? By studying Athenian democracy, we learn a lot about the values that the city seemed to hold. The most privileged people, of course, these adult male citizens. We learn about the amazing direct participation and its checks and balances to manage the system and create what they understood as equality. We also learn about the limitations, those who could not participate, the mistakes that were made, and the ancient critics. The people of the past, just like those of today, disagreed frequently on the strengths and weaknesses of their governments. Studying Plutarch's representation of Athenian democracy gives us a slightly different picture. Plutarch, of course, looks at the events of the past through the privileged lens of the future and through the biases of his own time and place. He also has an audience of Greeks and Romans that he wants to please and educate. So he sticks to the past to avoid being accused of criticizing the Roman system. However, he covertly tells us his thoughts through the moral lessons from the past. In terms of Athenian democracy, he focuses on the fickleness of the people and how this harms those who are talented. He often contrasts this with praise of the Spartan system with, with its assembly and kings. In this way, Plutarch, in a sense, in its simplest form, praises the Roman system. In the end, Plutarch's works on Athenian democracy and the men who led it give us an idea of the reception of Athenian democracy during the Roman Empire. Plutarch, in sum, speaks about its legacy in his time and how it might be used by men like him to learn from the past in order to navigate the present. Maybe most of all, we learn how important Athenian democracy was to the people who were able to participate. Thucydides, an ancient Greek historian, tells us that Pericles, one of the most famous leaders of the Athenian democracy, says, we, the Athenians, do not say that a man who takes no interest in politics is a man who minds his own business. We say that he has no business here at all. There's so much more to learn about Athenian democracy, so head on over to peoplingthepast.com for more resources and for other great videos. Thanks for watching. My name is Chandra Giroux, and this is Peopling the Past. <laughs>